Good afternoon, and welcome to The Brothers' War. Last month, we covered the victory in the Western Theater and the final adoption of the plans in the Eastern Theater. McDowell will go on the offensive this month. If you're interested in the American Civil War and want to see it detailed chronologically month by month, be sure to like this video and subscribe. Be sure to hit the bell button to get a notification when the next videos are uploaded. If you like my content, be sure to follow me on Twitter, where I live tweet a summary of that day's events 160 years after the fact. If you really like what I'm putting out, consider supporting me on Patreon. Links in the description. We will begin this month with the far less active Western Theater, where Lion will sits digesting the gains of last month. Many small skirmishes will be fought on the fringes, but nothing major happens this month. On the 6th, John C. Fremont is made commander of the Department of the West, but he has not been given command of General Lyon's Army of the West. In fact, Fremont has very little to do. His appointment is largely for political reasons, given that Fremont is such a notable for Republican. If you'll remember, he's the guy who ran for president in 1856. But there is considerable action in West Virginia, pitting Union General McClellan against the Rebel Garnet. Garnet commands the last notable secessionist force in the Western Virginia area, an area that has declared for the Union. On the 6th, McClellan leaves the town of Grafton, going on the offensive against Garnett near Beverly. Little Napoleon captures Buchanan on the 7th and receives report of a Confederate encampment on the sides of Rich Mountain. He dispatches General Rosecrans, commanding one brigade to deal with them. On the 10th, at dawn, knowing exactly where Garnett would be, Rosecrans attempted to take them in the rear of the camp, where there will be few defenders, in a surprise attack. But Rosecrans is the one surprised today, as the rebels had captured a Union messenger from McClellan and know all about the attack. Rosecrans finds the rebels already online and ready for action. However, the Yankees push through the rebel lines and drives the smaller Confederate force towards Garnett's main body. Rosecrans has the road blocked, and while the infantry is able to escape around the roadblock to the woods, the Confederate artillery has to be left behind. But the infantry escaped at night, and Rosecrans doesn't know they've left until dawn, so he joins up with the main group and McClellan gives chase in the afternoon of the 12th. McClellan was able to occupy Beverly with light fighting, and in the rain, Garnett gets lost and encamps at Carrick's Ford. McClellan dispatched Morris, who we met last month, to take them. On the rainy morning of July 13th, 1861, he found them at the fort, but lost the element of surprise due to an evident discharge from the ranks. Morris waited for his artillery to roll up before he engaged because the Confederates had entrenched their side of the fort, and while the artillery held the Confederates in cover behind the trenches in the rain, Colonel Milroy commanding the 9th Indiana went on a flanking maneuver. When the 9th opened fire, the rebel line broke and fled through the woods. They were pursued for a half mile before initiating a fighting retreat, but the Confederates had broken and the battle was over. In the wreckage, General Garnett's body was found face down in the water. He was the first general officer casualty of the Civil War. In three days fighting, the Union lost 38 killed and 115 wounded to the Confederates, 90 killed, 150 wounded, 150 captured, and 100 unspecified casualties. On the 14th, McClellan changed gears to occupation, and wired DC reporting his victories on that day. Also this month, General Sibley took command of the Confederate Army of New Mexico. Sibley has a grand plan that we will see unfold over the coming weeks and months. The Confederacy, at this point, has one major problem with many facets. The problem is the federal blockade. One facet of this is that all Confederate ports are closed, and so therefore they have no way to sell their cotton to the British. This is compounded by the fact that the Confederacy is cash-strapped in general, but if a good commander with a solid body of men could start in western Texas, march up the Rio Grande, capture the gold mines of Colorado, recruit Brigham Young to the cause, then capture the lightly defended ports of California, the Confederacy would have plenty of cash, a port, and a market for their cotton. Whether this was a sound strategy or simple insanity, well, I guess we'll see. Either way, this month he gets off to a good start at Messiah and Fort Fillmore, where the Union is broken and fled. We will now jump between Patterson and the Shenandoah Valley and McDowell in Washington, D.C., as they prepare and launch the offensive planned last month. The plan is for Patterson to pin Confederate General Joseph Johnston and his army down in the Shenandoah Valley so that the rebels remain divided, and McDowell can land a knockout punch at Manassas, then ride the train right down to Richmond. Well, on the 2nd, Patterson defeats a secessionist force of falling waters, causing Johnston to retreat. Johnston's army of the Shenandoah lacks adequate transportation and supplies, but Patterson is keenly aware that many of his 90-day wonders are about to finish their enlistments, so he moves quickly and invades the valley on the 4th of July. Also, as a side note, on the 4th of July, our friends in the 1st Minnesota are issued crab, intended for a crab bake, but none of the Minnesotans know how to cook crab. The dish is horribly prepared, and the men are slightly sickened for a couple days. But back to the main story. 
On the 8th, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is ordered by McDowell to work building 60 forts around Washington, D.C., which will occupy them for some time. On the 13th, Patterson is ordered by Scott to, quote, If not strong enough to beat the enemy next week, make a demonstration so as to detain him in the valley or in Winchester. Patterson responds that Johnston far outnumbers him, and the Confederate Army of the Shenandoah increases in numbers every day. Patterson goes on to request further clarification of orders. Such clarification, if it was ever made, has been lost to history. Either way, Patterson prepares to move out. On the 16th, he pushed Johnston's pickets back all the way to Bunker Hill. That same day, McDowell advanced with around 35,000 men towards Fairfax Courthouse. He disposes his force in such a manner, with the divisions taking alternate roads, so as to attempt to obscure his ultimate destination. But Beauregard knew exactly where McDowell's army was going. He had been tipped off by his spy network operating in Washington, D.C. The 1st Minnesota, in Franklin's brigade of Heinzelman's division, went with him. The day after, the 17th, because Patterson was doing nothing to stop him, General Joseph Johnston moved out from Winchester with his 10,000. Now, I know what you're asking. What is Patterson doing? Well, he has decided to stop his advance and go back to Charlestown from Bunker Hill, for reasons that remain unclear to this day. On the 18th, he wired Scott, informing him about the disposition of the forces in the valley and requested permission to attack. He did not take the initiative, and the Confederate Army of the Shenandoah will fatefully trickle into Manassas Junction on the 20th and 21st. On the 20th, Patterson wires Scott and told him that Johnston's army has magically disappeared. In recognition of this, Scott ordered him to take and hold the undefended Harper's Ferry. But let's step back really quick and follow McDowell's advance. But I'll wager you can guess how it ends. On the 17th, McDowell arrived in Fairfax Courthouse. It had been abandoned by the Confederacy, and so he ordered 1st Division to Georgetown as an advance guard. Beauregard on this day wired Johnston for aid. After all, Beauregard commanded 22,000 men and McDowell 35. The next day, 1st Division advanced to Centerville. Richardson's brigade, while performing reconnaissance, scouting out the rebel positions from across the river, had engaged Longstreet's Confederate brigade at Blackburn Fort. Artillery bombardment and rifle volleys are exchanged across the ford, and at 4 p.m. McDowell ordered Richardson to pull back. The Union suffered 19 killed and 38 wounded, and Longstreet's brigade 16 killed and 53 wounded. On the 19th, Jackson's brigade, part of Johnston's Army of the Shenandoah, passed through Thoroughfare Gap. They had nearly arrived. And you can bet they'll be very influential in the battle we all know is coming at Manassas Junction. And Thomas Jackson will definitely be receiving a full biography in the future, by the way. He's about to earn himself a very renowned nickname. By the 20th, McDowell had moved too fast, and seeing as he had only issued his army one day's rations, the men are hungry. He's going to wait in Centerville for one day for his supply train to catch up. The attack that was going to come on the 20th will now come on the 21st. But he gets his plans in order at this point. He's done some fair recon of the bull run, and he knows where the Confederate positions are. He sets up his troops with 28,000 men in the main body, supported by 49 big guns and a reserve division of 5,000. The attack is to begin at 2 a.m. with an artillery bombardment to soften the rebels up, then lead a diversionary attack at Stone Bridge at 4 a.m. While the diversion holds the Confederates in place, 2nd and 3rd Divisions will go around his right flank across Sudley Ford, going around the fords that the Confederates hold in strength. The 10,000 men of 2nd and 3rd Division will then roll up the Confederate line and break them. However, McDowell is missing a crucial piece of intelligence. He has been out of communication with Patterson for several days, and he still thinks Johnston's army is still in the Shenandoah Valley. In reality, three of Johnston's brigades arrived today, and the fourth will arrive tomorrow, bringing the Confederate numbers about equal to his own. Had McDowell only issued his men more food and gone ahead with the attack on the 20th, he would have had a decisive numbers advantage. 21st of July, 1861, 2 a.m. The Union artillery begins pounding Evans' brigade at Stone Bridge in the opening shots of the diversionary attack. Evans, it would seem, falls for the attack, calls for reinforcements from Colonel Cock. But by 8 a.m., six hours later, no infantry assault arrives, so he calls the bluff and redeploys his force. He left four companies at the bridge and took the rest of his force north to the Breadsville Road, intercepting Burnside's brigade, which is the only brigade of 2nd or 3rd Division that has actually made it to position on time. Cock's brigade remains south of the bridge. Sherman's brigade, seeing Burnside's brigade flagging, crosses north of Stone Bridge and joins the fighting at 10 a.m., but the Confederates hold. Around 11, 3rd Division arrives and pushes the Confederates southwards due to their intense numbers advantage. 
Everything is going well for the North at this point. The Southerners retreat back to Henry House Hill, and McDowell, who is personally commanding the Union right, is sending telegrams to Washington, essentially live-tweeting how well the, the battle is doing. The picnickers from D.C., Centerville, Alexandria, and Manassas are thoroughly enjoying the show, cheering for their respective teams. But by noon, Beauregard and Johnston know that the attack in the center is a diversion. So Beauregard sends Jackson, B., and Bartow's brigades to reinforce the Confederate left. All of these brigades are from Johnston's army. If Patterson had done his job, what happens next would never have happened. B and Bartow both break their brigades against the Union lines, but Jackson's brigade holds firm with artillery support. B and Bartow rally their men for a second charge, and General B, while leading from the front, shouts, There stands Jackson like a stone wall! Rally behind the Virginians! Colonel Thomas Jackson, all the way to the present day, receives his legendary nom de guerre, Stonewall Jackson. The rebel lines push. The Firezwaves counterattack with Griffin and Ricketts batteries, but they are pushed back and go online at the top of a hill. The rebels try to flank the Zwaves, but it is Jeb Stuart's cavalry who break them. Jeb Stuart, you may remember, was the cavalry officer president with Robert E. Lee at Johns Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry. Heintzelman sends the 1st Michigan and our friends the 1st Minnesota to support the batteries, and the Midwesterners take the hill, and the batteries go back online, blasting holes in the Confederate lines. An interesting anecdote. If you'll remember, the 1st Minnesota is mostly clad in red shirts, felt hats, and black pants. Aside from certainly being incredibly hot and uncomfortable in the Virginia July, they look very similar to an Alabama regiment. Lieutenant Colonel Boone, a Confederate, approached the Minnesotans, mistaking them for Alabamians. He is challenged, asked, are you a secessionist? Boone responds, I am a Mississippian, and taken prisoner. The highest ranking prisoner taken by the Union force that day. By 3 p.m., the Union force is exhausted and becoming overwhelmed, but does not call on the reserves of Burnside's Brigade or Shanks' Brigade or 4th Division. Sherman made an attack uphill to the Confederate artillery, but he was pushed back. But the Yankees have the numbers. They have the cannons. Another anecdote. At around this time, the reports are communicated by telegram directly to the White House, where Lincoln receives them anxiously. He goes to Scott's headquarters to discuss the situation. He found General Scott taking a nap. After waking him and informing him of the situation, Scott tells Lincoln there's nothing to worry about, and the rebels will soon be routed. Lincoln departs, and Scott returns to sleep. Shortly after 3 p.m., Johnston and Beauregard threw Elzey's brigade and Early's brigade into the fight. Several thousand fresh men, shrieking a rebel yell, push the Union lines and tip the scales for the rebels. The exhausted, hot, hungry, and thirsty Union line breaks, except for the regulars who cover the retreat. Ricketts' battery is captured by the 33rd Virginia in Stonewall's brigade. The 33rd is wearing blue uniforms, and so the artillery didn't know they were enemies until it was too late. The 1st Minnesota initially retreated in good order until the formation was disrupted by some Confederate cavalry, at which point no semblance of order is upheld. The Union forces skedaddle north, and then east to Centerville, pursued by the Confederates, covered by the Union regular forces, but the Confederates give up the chase at the Centerville Ridge. The Union troops regroup at Centerville, wait for a Confederate killing blow that never arrives, and then marched back to Washington, where they all collapsed into their quarters. The victorious Confederates lost 400 men killed, 1,600 men wounded, of whom 225 later died of their wounds. Colonels B and Bartow were both killed. But Stonewall Jackson propelled himself into fame with the outstanding performance of his brigade. Rest assured, we will be seeing much of him in the coming months. But McDowell's army lost 625 killed, 950 men wounded, and had over 1,200 men captured. But it is not all doom and gloom for the Union. Lieutenant Ames of Battery D, 50 West, was wounded, but refused to leave the field and directed the fire of his battery from the top of a caisson. He received the Medal of Honor for the deed. Captain Ricketts, of the battery bearing his name, was wounded four times and captured. Colonel Michael Corcoran, of the Irish 69th New York, was wounded and captured. James Cameron, brother of the Secretary of War Simon Cameron and Colonel of the 79th New York Highlanders, was killed. Captain Richard Arnold, an artillery commander, lost all but one gun in the fighting. That gun was saved by Corporal Owen McGuff, who received the Medal of Honor. The closing phase of the battle was witnessed by Jefferson Davis, and he, and generally everyone else, then anticipated a march on Washington. The invasion seems inevitable, but Beauregard and Johnston's forces have been greatly weakened, and they will take their time. Either way, whoever is in charge of the Union forces will have the defense of Washington first and foremost in their mind. Colonel Sherman, who commanded a brigade at the battle, said later, quote, it is easy to criticize a battle after it is over, 
but all now admit that none others, equally raw in war, could have done better than we did at Bull Run. His assessment is perhaps the most positive in the North. Thomas Cobb, Southern rabble rouser and fire eater, said that Manassas was, quote, one of the decisive battles of the world and has secured our independence. The Southern newspaper Richmond Whig said, quote, the breakdown of the Yankee race, their unfitness for empire, forces dominion on the South. We are compelled to take the scepter of power. We must adapt ourselves to our new destiny. Our friends in the first actually performed quite well in the battle, being noted in General Heinzelman's report as being cool under fire, as well as being the only regiment in his command that retreated in good order. The first suffered 49 killed, 107 wounded, and 34 missing, most of those missing being wounded soldiers who had to be left behind. This is a casualty rate of over 20%, the greatest loss of any Union regiment in the battle. The night of the 21st to 22nd of July was sleepless for Abraham Lincoln. The first order of business, obviously, was to fire General Patterson. His inactivity and refusal to take the initiative was perhaps the largest deciding factor in the battle. Patterson isn't just fired, he is cashiered from the army entirely, hangs up his uniform, and went about the rest of his life an ignominious cotton miller. Also, on this night, Lincoln decides to replace McDowell too, and at 2 a.m. he wires George McClellan to be the commander of the Department of Washington. Now, we know the future. We know where McClellan's career goes, and it's very easy to criticize Lincoln for choosing him, but let's look at the other options he has. General Scott? He's needed in Washington, and he can't ride a horse anymore due to his advanced age. Certainly not him. McDowell and Patterson are obviously out. General Butler? Well, last month he choked at Big Bethel, and he doesn't lead his men from the front. We need someone who does that. General Lyon? He's desperately needed in Missouri. If we took him, that would put Fremont in charge, and he's only in command for political reasons. General Grant and General Buell are too far out west to get to D.C. promptly. Kearney is too much of a swashbuckler to command a whole army. Keyes, McClernand, Prentiss, Reynolds, none have ever led an independent command. The only option, then, is McClellan, who secured West Virginia for the Union. General Rosecrans will replace McClellan as the commander of the Department of Ohio. Later on in the night, Lincoln calls for 555,000 volunteers to serve three-year enlistments. Three days later, he will call for half a million more. It is now very, very clear that the war will not be over soon. The Confederates also undergo considerable reorganization. In lieu of the fact that Banks now holds Harper's Ferry and the arsenal and the factory therein, and that West Virginia is now hostile ground, there is no real reason for the Army of the Shenandoah to exist, so it will be consolidated into the Army of the Potomac with General Johnston commanding. Beauregard, who receives much of the praise for the victory, was promoted to full general, but was retained as second in command of the Army of the Potomac. There is also the issue of uniforms and flags in both armies. At this point, neither army has truly standardized on a uniform. The federal troops wear blue, but the volunteers in both armies were essentially whatever they had on hand, mostly gray. If you remember the 33rd Virginia, a Confederate unit was wearing blue, and K Company of the 1st Minnesota was wearing gray. Over the coming months, the Confederates will attempt to standardize on the gray commonly worn by state troops, and the Union will standardize on the federal blue. Also, of note are the flags in question. From a distance, the stars and bars and the stars and stripes look far too similar, so Beauregard went through the files of the proposed flags for the Confederacy from earlier that year and chose this. The Confederate battle flag. We know it well today. On the 27th, Little Napoleon took command of the Army of the Potomac, formed by the merger of the Army of Northeastern Virginia, the Army of the Shenandoah, the Department of Washington, and the Department of Pennsylvania. Fifteen divisions, an artillery reserve, and a cavalry command. He has a lot of work ahead of him, forging this band of defeated men into an army. In his own words, he found, quote, No army to command, only a mere collection of regiments cowering on the banks of the Potomac, some perfectly raw, others dispirited by their recent defeat. But McClellan is in his element here. He was born to be a drill master. His first order of business was to form a military police unit, then put them to work arresting stragglers in the streets, pulling men out of bars, and weeding competent officers from their posts, and every day, multiple times a day, drill. Mind-numbing, muscle memory building, discipline instilling drill. As McClellan begins his tenure, General Johnson will disperse his forces across the Potomac, training cannons on the capital as a threat from the west. 
McClellan, however, is not rushed. He knows Johnston is just as disorganized as he is. Nobody is ready for a large battle. Now, we look at our friends in the 1st Minnesota. Their previous assistant surgeon was captured at Bull Run, and their new one, Dr. Daniel Hand, finds the regiment completely demoralized. Insufficient food, tattered and torn clothing that doesn't match the rest of the army, and even talks of mutiny. It didn't help the fact that the men had not been paid yet after three months of service. Colonel Gorman quickly became a scapegoat for all the yields of the regiment. Many of the men, and even some of the officers, looked down on him for leading the regiment from the rear during the engagement. One in five men was shot during the battle, but Gorman? He was all too well in his fine clothes with his regiment between him and the enemy. Some closing notes to round out the month. On the 4th of July, U.S. Congress convened in their emergency session. They will go to work on military affairs, allocating funds for the War Department and kicking off a shipbuilding spree to get the Navy up to speed and increase the effectiveness of the blockade. On the 25th, they will postpone the payment of all, all, foreign debts owned by the United States federal government. This sours the relationships of the USA to the great powers of Europe and almost bankrupts Mexico. Also, the Congress will expand the Marine Corps to 93 officers and 3,074 enlisted men. On the 8th, a man known to history as Major Taylor of the Confederate States of America arrived in D.C. with letters for Lincoln from Jefferson Davis and letters for Scott from Beauregard. This is the first time, and one of the very few known times, that Davis and Lincoln ever communicated with each other. On the 16th, John Dahlgren, U.S. Navy, the inventor of the Dahlgren gun, the standard smoothbore used by both navies, an exceptionally competent man, was appointed chief of the Navy Ordnance Bureau. On the 19th, well, do you remember Robert Toombs? During the debates of the Compromise of 1850, he was the Whig from Georgia who was really into the Northern Aggression Conspiracy Theory, and he was basically the first open secessionist in Congress. He was also Davis' Secretary of State. Well, on the 19th, he was appointed Brigadier General. He will be replaced as Secretary of State by Robert Hunter, a plantation owner from Virginia. On the 20th, the Provisional Congress of the CSA met. In their session, we will see, they admit Missouri and Kentucky to the Confederacy, despite the fact that neither state has seceded. They admit representatives from New Mexico and various indigenous tribes as well. They also call for the first election of the real Congress, not the Provisional Congress, and the elections are to be held in November. So ends the fateful month of July 1861. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, give it a like, and if you didn't, a dislike. In the comments, you can leave constructive criticism, questions for the Q&A, suggestions for special episodes, and whatever else you'd like to put in there. If you need more Civil War, be sure to follow me on Twitter, where the coverage is always daily. Be sure to share this video with the history buff in your life, and I will see you next time, where McClellan whips the Army of the Potomac into shape, and things really kick off in Missouri.